morning, good afternoon, and uh, good evening to all our speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audiences in different parts of the world. Welcome back to yet another session of very educative lectures for you. The speaker for the first session of today is a special guest from the UAE, Professor Deborah Garoso. Professor Garoso is an Italian neurosurgeon so specialized in peripheral nerve surgery. She received her training in neurosurgery in Ospedale Borgo Taranto in, in Verona. After 28 years of practice in Italy, she relocated to Dubai, UAE, and currently she works as a consultant neurosurgeon in Mediclinic Parkview Hospital and Mediclinic City Hospital in Dubai. Dr. Deborah Garazzo refined her surgical skills in peripheral nerve surgery, visiting well-known referral centers in Sweden, Germany, and China. And in 2006, during her fellowship in Department of Hand Surgery of Washington Hospital in Shanghai, she set up a collaboration with Professor Gu Yu Dong and his team promoting the foundation of Sino-European Meeting on Brachial Plexus Surgery that represented one of the most distinguished scientific events related to the surgical discipline for several years. Her clinical interests are focused in the field of peripheral nerve surgery, especially brachial plexus, micro-reconstructive surgery for adults and children, and management of peripheral nerve tumors in patients affected with neurofibromatosis. Her scientific production includes two books on her subspecialty and 16 book chapters and more than 20 articles published in international journals. She is a member of editorial board of several international journals and to her international reputation she has been an invited speaker faculty in many hands-on workshops and educational courses and conferences in the countries around the world. She is currently a member of the Italian Society of Neurosurgery and has served as the president of the Peripheral Nerve Surgery Committee of the Singe from 2009 to 14. She has also been appointed Vice President of WFNS Committee for Peripheral Nerve Surgery for two terms and is the current Vice President of the Emirates Society of Neurological Surgeons. We are extremely honored to have her today at webinars and today she'll be talking about an overview of obstructive brachial plexus palsy. The speaker for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Nepal, Dr. Maya Bhattajan. Dr. Bhattajan is an assistant professor, Department of Neurosurgery, Nepal Medical College Teaching Hospital, Kathmandu. She is the first practicing lady neurosurgeon in Nepal, and she is a role model for many aspiring female neurosurgeons around the world. She is a noted author as well as an editorial member of the Nepal Journal of Neurosciences. We are extremely honored to have her today at our webinars, and today she'll be talking about women in neurosurgery, challenges and opportunities in Nepal. The chair for the first session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Brazil, Professor Jose Guedes. Professor Guedes is the head of division of neurosurgery at the Jaffrey and Gunley University Hospital. He is a head and professor of neurosurgery at the School of Medicine and Surgery of the, the Federal University of State of Rio de Janeiro, which is UNIRIO. And he's also the member of the Deliberative Council of the Brazilian Society of Neurosurgery, professor of human anatomy at the Federal University of the State of Rio de Janeiro. He is a vice chairman of the Peripheral Nerve Surgery Committee of the WFNS. He was a former president of the Society of Neurosurgery of Rio de Janeiro. He has been also the president of the Southern Cone Neurological Surgery Society. Uh, he was also the former president of the Peripheral Nerve Chapter of the Latin American Federation of Neurosurgical Societies. He is a renowned faculty who is a part of various conferences and workshops conducted worldwide. We are extremely thankful to him for accepting our invitation to chair the session of Professor Deborah Garoso. The chair for the second session of today's webinar is our honored guest from Malaysia, Dr. Sharon Casilda Theophilus. She is a consultant neurosurgeon at the KPJ Johor Specialist Hospital, Malaysia. She is also a senior lecturer with the Monash Medical University, Malaysia, and she is the first practicing female neurosurgeon in Malaysia. She currently serves as the chair of the Women in Neurosurgery chapter of the ACNS. She is also on the member of the Executive Council of the Malaysia. We are extremely grateful to her for accepting her invitation to chair the session of Dr. Maya Bhattachan. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato, I would like to welcome both the speakers, chairs, and the wonderful audience to this online platform of ACNS webinars. A very warm welcome to our colleagues in China, and we are extremely grateful to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel. So, Dr. Liu Bun Singh from Malaysia should be joining me soon as a co-host. And with that introduction, I would like to hand over this online podium to our first chair, Professor Jose Gudes. Yes, thank you. Uh, first of all, I must say that it's uh, a great honor to be here with you this morning, this afternoon. And I must thank, first of all, Professor Yoko Kato and Dr. Raja Kuri for this kind invitation. I salute 
my, my colleagues, my esteemed colleagues, Dr. Maya and Dr. Sharon Theophilus uh, in this chair. And I must say that uh, it's a great pleasure, a great honor uh, to hear uh, my, my very good friend, Dr. Deborah Garoso. Dr. Deborah Garoso is one of our, our leaders, one of the, the most important leaders in peripheral nerve and brachial plexus, in lumbar sacral plexus surgery. So, uh, Dr. Deborah Garoso, please. So first of all, I have to say that I'm absolutely touched by these uh, great words uh, uh, towards my efforts uh, to become, uh, you know, a neurosurgeon doing peripheral nerve surgery. And, um, and I'm extremely happy today because we are going to talk about obstetrical brachial plexus palsies. Uh, that is usually um, um, a pathology that most of the times uh, is what I was saying is that um, I'm extremely happy that today we're talking about obstetrical brachial plexus palsies because usually uh, peripheral nerve surgery is something that is already um, just uh, relegated to very few um, neurosurgeons. Uh, and when we talk about pediatric neurosurgery, nobody ever mentions uh, the presence of obstetrical brachial plexus palsies. Uh, they're usually something that is considered to be managed by orthopedic or plastic surgeons. Uh, and I, I think we have to fight this conception. I think this is a misconception. Obstetrical brachial plexus palsy must come on board in pediatric neurosurgery. And we have to make efforts uh, to bring on this new mindset. So um, I'm now going to try to provide you a brief overview on obstetrical brachial plexus palsies, um, um, illustrating uh, uh, some basic concepts um, um, and trying to provide an overview from birth to adulthood. Now, obstetrical brachial plexus palsies, which are um, injuries of the brachial plexus uh, in babies uh, due to peculiar circumstances of the delivery, are mostly known in, in many countries as Erb's palsy. Uh, yet, I have to say, this is a term that nowadays we do not accept anymore. Uh, we prefer the definition of obstetrical brachial plexus palsy, or more recently, many others uh, actually prefer to um, uh, name them neonatal brachial plexus palsies. So I thought it might be interesting to start with a little bit of history. Uh, we know that obstetrical brachial plexus uh, have been already dis uh, described by um, the ancient Greeks and the Romans, but the first medical illustration has been done by a Scottish physician, uh, Dr. William Smanley, that described neonatal brachial plexus palsy in 1754 in his textbook that was a set of anatomical tables with explanations and abridgment on the practice of midwifery. Later on, there were studied better uh, by um, one uh, German neurologist, Wilhelm Heinrich Herb, and a French neurologist, Guillaume Benjamin, Benjamin Amand Duchenne. They mostly focus on the lesions involving the upper brachial plexus. And then we have the, this couple, uh, Augusta Klumke and Jules Dejerine, that were the ones um, uh, that studied the total pulses. Uh, when we start talking about the epidemiological data, we see that the published data in the medical literature uh, really vary from country to country. And uh, in some countries, we don't even have any epidemiological stud uh, studies. Uh, so, for instance, this is true for the United Arab Emirates. I don't have any epidemiological data related to the country where I live. Etiopathogenesis uh, uh, is related to risk factors uh, that we can divide into three categories. Uh, we have risk factors related to the mother, to the baby, and to the circumstances of labor and delivery. Maternal risk factors uh, encompasses uh, the advanced age of the pregnant lady. Uh, if it's her own uh, first child, uh, and then also uh, constitutional factors um, um, related to the pelvic anatomy and the high body mass index. Uh, and in addition to obesity, other comorbidities that are usually known uh, to be maternal risk factors are diabetes and hypertension. The risk factors related to the babies uh, are the high birth weight. 
So we know that macrosomic children have a high chances to develop, to sustain this kind of injury. And this is also the reason why if you have a woman that already deliver a macrosomic child, uh, with the brachial plexus injury, the uh, subsequent um, children um, are at high risk of presenting the same complication. And therefore, we should consider to offer cesarean section in order to prevent the occurrence of the brachial plexus injury. And then we talk about the labor and delivery risk factors. It is known that 60% of obstetrical brachial plexus palsies are consequent to shoulder dystocia. This is a condition that happens when the baby gets stuck in the delivery canal because there is an impingement of the shoulder against the pelvic bone. And in order to distangle the, the child and, and let it come out of the delivery canal, mm -hmm. uh, the, the gynae has to apply attraction uh, that, if excessive, may actually result um, uh, in a damage of the brachial plexus. However, these are not the only conditions. Uh, we may also have uh, the occurrence of an obstetrical brachial plexus palsy in a bridge position. This is actually a very dangerous situation because we might have up to 23% of cases where the damage is bilateral and it's frequently associated with root avulsions. Uh, other conditions related to delivery might be forceps delivery, vacuum extraction, precipitous delivery, and prolonged labor. All babies, uh, when they are born, present a flail arm. But in 70% of cases, after a few days or weeks after the birth, we notice uh, that there is a recovery of the end function. However, some of the children will present a persistent flail arm. So finally, we can uh, distinguish the, the damage based on the injury pattern. And before actually we are going to get into the classification, I would like to remind you a few basic principles about nerve injuries. For those of you that are not so familiar with peripheral nerve surgery, maybe it's good to have a, a little refresh of some concepts. So the first thing that we have to consider is that there is a, a, a major classification of nerve injuries in preganglionic and postganglionic injuries. So preganglionic injuries are also known as root avulsions and are conditions when the root is torn off the spinal cord. The root, the roots may be completely avulsed. So, and so this implies both the sensory and the motor rootlets, or there might be just a partial avulsion. When we have a root avulsion, in the vast majority of cases, uh, there is also a tear of the dura that surrounds the nerve root. And through such dural tear, there might be the occurrence of an arachnoidal bulging uh, that is progressively filled by CSF and eventually results in the formation of a mushroom-like um, pocket um, uh, that is known uh, under the name of pseudomeningocele. If the roots maintain the continuity with the spinal cord and the damage is distal along the course of the trunk, then we talk about postganglionic injuries. So what kind of postganglionic injuries do we have? We may have a, a mild degree of damage that is mainly related to a disruption of the myelin shift with um, uh, integrity of the connective shifts and the axons. And this is called the neuropraxia and is obviously the most favorable kind of type uh, of damage. Then we have the axonotmesis uh, when the endoneurium, perineurium, and epineurium are intact, but there has been a damage on the axons and the myelin shift. And then we have the third kind of damage, which is obviously the most severe grade when there is a complete loss of the anatomical continuity. So now that we refresh these concepts, we go back to the injury patterns and we see that we may distinguish basically two main groups, um, injuries of the upper plexus, which we might further um, subdivide in injuries of C5 and C6 uh, that account for about 50% of cases, uh, and then C5, C6, and C7. And then we have approximately 25% of babies that present a, fl a persistent flail arm uh, that might be associated uh, with uh, an ornery sign. 
Now, uh, upper plexus palsy uh, are related to a damage on C5 and C6. In these cases, the baby presents a paralysis of the shoulder muscles and the biceps. Um, if we want to uh, investigate the kind of damage sustained by the, by the brachial plexus, uh, usually we have a, a, a spectrum uh, of injuries that mostly involve neuroapraxia or axonotmesis. The occurrence of a neurotmesis is very uncommon and avulsions are exceptional, unless in the cases that have been um, uh, related to breach delivery, as I mentioned before. Babies that present a damage on C5 and C6 tend to have an infrarotation postua that is known as waiter step position. If we also have an involvement of C7 root, we will have a paralysis of shoulder muscles and biceps plus an impairment of extensors. This is a situation that is more severe than the damage on C5 and C6, obviously, and when we examine the kind of the type of damage, it's a varying range from neuroapraxia to neurotmesis, and even in this group, avulsions are rare. About 25% of patients, as we said, present a total palsy, and we distinguish two subgroups based on the presence of the Orner sign. So, uh, some babies present a total palsy without Orner sign, or maybe they had a temporarily uh, present Orner sign that then recover after some time. Now, usually these babies present as a type of damage, a rupture of the upper roots associated with neurotmesis of the lower roots. Then we have by the babies that present the most severe clinical conditions. Uh, these are the total pulses with the persistent Orner sign. The type of damage is usually a variable rupture of the upper roots, C5, C6, and C7, that is associated with neurotmesis and evulsions of C8 and T1. So this is obviously the most severe type of damage. Um, so uh, when we talk about the natural history, uh, we have to differentiate between spontaneous recovery and indication for surgery. We know that um, the vast majority of babies can actually present a, spont um, a tendency for spontaneous recovery. But um, what is very clear is that spontaneous recovery is related to the kind of injury pattern. Now, when we examine the natural history of babies with total palsy, we see that babies that present no ornar sign, so they have a flail arm, but they have no ornar sign, may present some signs of spontaneous recovery in about in less than 10% of cases. Nevertheless, this is never a, a functionally valid spontaneous recovery. Uh, it's always uh, um, burdened by a severe functional limitation. The children that have a total palsy with Orner sign do not present any sign of spontaneous recovery. There is never any spontaneous recovery. So obviously, if we have a child that presents a persistent flail arm, regardless the presence of Orner sign, we always have to give indication for surgery. And because, as I said, there might be the possible occurrence of avulsions, we usually consider that a pre-op MRI is mandatory in order to study the case before you go for surgery. So the children that present the, the high rates of spontaneous recovery are actually the children with an upper brachial plexus palsy. And if we distinguish between the damage of C5 and C6 and C5, C6, C7, we see that the children that present a damage of C5 and C6 actually present very high rate of spontaneous recovery that can be approximately equal to 90%, whereas uh, the rate for spontaneous recovery in the group that sustain a damage on C5, C6, and C7 is lower, although still quite remarkable because 70% of babies present a, a good a valid spontaneous recovery. So the point is, how do we select the surgical candidates in this group? 
because we cannot just have considered by default that simply because a baby has an upper brachial plexus palsy uh, is going to recover spontaneously. Um, and, you know, the selection of surgical candidates might be a bit tricky. So we're trying to focus on the diagnostic workup. So normally we examine the babies clinically, and then um, we are going to talk also about the role of the electric electrodiagnostic studies and imaging. Now, before we get into the actual role of the neurophysiology and the imaging, I have to emphasize that we have to remember that in order to perform this kind of investigations, uh, babies have to be sedated. Um, so, you know, this is also an aspect that we have to consider. So how helpful are really electrodiagnostic studies in babies? Uh, nowadays, I still see babies refer to me with EMG and nerve conduction studies. Uh, and I have to say, um, the, the indication for these studies is actually extremely controversial. Usually, um, it's technically challenging to perform an EMG and nerve conduction study for a brachial plexus, and obviously even more in the case of a baby. And then there is something that we have to consider. The neurophysiology of babies is different uh, uh, than the neurophysiology of the adults, uh, because in babies, um, uh, we have phenomena of luxury innervation and collateral aberrant innervation that usually do not allow a complete denervation of the muscles. Mm -hmm. So the, the result is that usually the EMG and nerve conduction study are overly optimistic uh, um, when compared uh, with the baby's clinical presentation and clinical course. So to cut a long story short, I'm sorry for the, for the friends that believe in neurophysiologists for babies, uh, but for babies, uh, we don't get any useful information. Preoperative MRI in babies uh, with upper brachial plexus palsy is usually indicated only in cases of breach delivery because we know that those are the ones that may harbor root avulsions. Otherwise, in all the other cases of up, upper plexus palsy, uh, we follow the children clinically and the indication for surgery is given according to the clinical evaluation. And what we monitor is actually the recovery of the biceps. So if we do not see any signs of recovery of the biceps, then we might give indication for surgery. And this is uh, um, usually, um, the, there is not a uniform consensus in the, uh, among the others. Somebody um, like, for instance, Gilbert advocates that, that if uh, within three months you don't see a recovery of the biceps, you should go for a, a surgical indication. But some others, uh, some other surgeons, and I belong to the, to the latter group, uh, believe that actually we might uh, delay a little bit, even to five months. So when it comes to surgical timing, my personal surgical timing is I give indication for total pulses when the babies are between three and four months. And for upper plexus injuries, I wait till six months. And this is because I also include uh, what might be the complications, the risk of um, submitting a small baby to general anesthesia. So after four months, usually um, you can do general anesthesia quite safely. And, um, and this would be my, my surgical timing. What happens if the babies are not um, referred to you uh, within this uh, correct uh, time? Uh, what happens with the late referral cases? There is a um, agreement among the others uh, that for total pulses, uh, there is always an indication for late surgery. Uh, whereas when it's the case of upper pulses, um, uh, the evaluation might be, you know, um, varying uh, case by case. Uh, um, but anyway, uh, it might be a good idea still to consider the surgical repair within three years uh, of age of the child. So what about the surgical technique? Um, now, this is a very important uh, situation to emphasize. When we expose um, uh, the brachial plexus palsy, uh, usually what we see in most children is a neuroma in continuity of the upper trunk with preservation, some preservation of conduction at intraoperative electrodiagnostic studies. Now, 
um, the presence of the neuroma in continuity associated with some preservation of conduction um, has prompted some others uh, only to perform a neurolysis. Now, this is a big mistake. You don't go for surgery and do just a neurolysis in, in these children uh, because you are not going to really provide uh, uh, better chances of spontaneous recovery. So we have to do is that we really have to um, treat also the, um, the, the child with uh, a repair strategy that might be the graft repair or the nerve transfers. So what do we do? The repair strategy might be resecting the neuroma, reconstructing the upper trunk. And uh, when it comes to the function of the shoulder, we might actually uh, decide to associate a nerve transfer of the spinal accessory to the suprascapular nerve, uh, probably because we consider that this might give a, a better some better results. Uh, some others perf uh, prefer to perform this kind of um, a nerve transfer with a posterior approach. Uh, but I have to say, I, I normally do that with anterior approach, and uh, and I, I don't think there is a, a particular issue with that. The graft reconstruction is done harvesting both sural nerves. Another point what would be, um, if you have avulsions of the upper roots, and this is something that, as we said, may happen in children that had a bridge delivery, um, or maybe um, there is some spontaneous recovery that you can already monitor and you do not want to resect the, the neuroma because otherwise the child would, would completely lose what he has already recovered. So you want to add, you don't want to subtract. So in these cases, uh, the, a good, a valid repair strategy might be to um, re-enervate the muscular cutaneous uh, using a nerve transfer um, the medial pectoral nerve can be used as donor, and then we uh, reconstruct the, the, the shoulder with the transfer I mentioned before, the spinal accessory to suprascapular nerve transfer. Some cases, especially if the children are not promptly referred, they may also have developed uh, some intra-rotation deformity uh, with even a limitation in passive extra rotation. So in these cases, uh, I associate the nerve repair also with what we call an anterior release. So basically um, what we have in these children is that there is an hypertrophy of the coracoid process uh, that uh, impedes the rotation of the humeral head. And the coracohumeral ligament becomes uh, uh, thicker and acts as an extra capsular tether to the external rotation. So what we do is that we demolish the um, this, the anterior release consists of demolition of the coracoid process and resecting the coracohumeral ligament. And as you can see, we can really obtain a remarkable uh, improvement of passive extra rotation. What if the child has a total palsy? Uh, the repair strategy mainly focuses on uh, uh, trying to renovate the end. That's the key point of repair strategy in total pulses. So what we can do is that um, we, um, as I mentioned before, we usually have a rupture of the upper roots. So we will use one of the upper roots to renovate the lower trunk. Sometimes you are so lucky um, that you can actually uh, lift the, the lower trunk up to the, to the C6 uh, or C5 and be able to perform a direct suture between the, the proximal uh, end of the, um, of the inferior trunk and, uh, and, the, and the root, the, the donor root. And then you reconstruct the upper trunk and then you use the spinal accessory nerve for the suprascapular nerve, as we said before. All babies that have been operated are going to be immobilized in a cast um, that uh, is usually maintained for two or three weeks. And then uh, after they remove the cast, they have to start physiotherapy. So what about surgical outcome? Uh, so first of all, I have to remind you that we are not going to see an immediate uh, recovery of the um, uh, function. Uh, for a few months, you actually don't see anything. And then there is a, you know, the, the occurrence of the initial signs of the recovery. 
So we evaluate the surgical outcome using a MALET score that you see in the left part of the slides. And when it comes to upper plexus injuries, we can see that the results are really good because uh, more than 50% of children really regain an excellent uh, shoulder abduction, extra rotation, and elbow flexion. And in some cases, uh, if we are not happy with the results, we can further improve the results uh, going for palliative surgery. So uh, this is an example uh, of a child that I operated. One of the first, sorry. So this child presented C5 and C6 uh, with avulsions of the roots. She was a case of bridge delivery and uh, she was operated at six months. And as you can see, she has recovered a very valid function of the, of the limb. Incomplete pulses results are less good. Um, we can recover a, a rather good shoulder and elbow, but uh, what about the hand? Uh, usually there is this idea that you can reconstruct, you can renovate the end in obstetrical brachial plexus pulses. Is this really true? Uh, now, if we objectively re-evaluate the end recovery in these children two years after the surgery, we see that usually there are favorable results in less than 30% of cases. Uh, we can still improve the end function uh, with secondary procedures, uh, but we have to be honest and we have to admit that actually despite of our initial enthusiasm and function uh, remains still pretty basic and um, certainly not comparable with the dexterity of the normal hand. But, you know, it's always better than having a, a hand that does not work at all. Now, um, the last part of my presentation is going to focus on differences between brachial plexus injuries in adults and newborns. And these are some of the things that we usually uh, see. Uh, first of all, that um, there is no evident muscle hypertrophy, that there is uh, a difference um, um, of the neurophysiology of the Horner sign, and then also that there is a lack of uh, uh, chronic pain syndromes. Why? And the reason is that children are developing beings. And so this is the reason why we have different uh, uh, features. Now, uh, the most impressive uh, uh, thing when you examine a baby is that even if they have a complete brachial plexus palsy with multiple avulsions, you do not see a muscle hypertrophy, which is one of the um, main things that you immediately notice in an adult, as you can see in the, in the slides here. So why don't we have a muscle hypertrophy? Uh, first of all, let's uh, um, not forget that these are low kinetic event, uh, kinetic energy events, uh, and the rate of evulsive injuries in babies is definitely um, less severe than in adults. Uh, but then also babies present a much higher rate of axonal sprouting, uh, and they have those phenomena that I mentioned before of collateral renovation, luxury um, innervation. So the muscle... Uh, the muscles are never completely denervated, and this explains the hypertrophy. Then another interesting thing is that it actually there is a change in the pattern of innervation when the baby uh, grows. So in adults, we know that if we have an ornery sign, it's always related to an injury of the um, stellate ganglion that is in close proximity with C8 and T1. In babies, the uh, Orner sign can actually result uh, from um, avulsion of C7. So you might have an avulsion of C7 uh, that is responsible of the occurrence of an Orner sign. So there is a, a difference in the injury, um, in the um, innervation pattern. But the most interesting thing is the complete lack of chronic pain. Now, whoever has experience of brachial plexus injuries in adults knows that the main problem for the patients are actually the, the severe um, uh, chronic uh, pain syndromes, uh, which are not present. We don't have evidence of chronic pain behavior um, in children with obstetrical brachial plexus palsies. Why? 
So we have to go again and study the development and focus on what happens in peripheral nerves in a developing human being. So when we make a, um, a, um, a study uh, in, um, uh, in babies, uh, um, for sensory and motor conduction velocities. Uh, we see that at birth, uh, the velocities at values which are less than 50% the normal values. Uh, and it takes approximately two years uh, for these va uh, values uh, to become the same than the adults. And this is correlated with the fact that there is a progressive increase of the sodium channels and the clustering of sodium channels uh, over this period. Now, when we go and study the biochemistry uh, of neuropathic pain syndromes, uh, we know that if there is an injury uh, on a nerve in adults, uh, there is usually the occurrence of clustering of the sodium channels at the tips of the damaged nerves. The clustering of sodium channels uh, triggers a condition of hyperexcitability of the sensory fibers. And this is the neurophysiological, the biochemical basis of the onset of neuropathic pain. So in these children, the lack of chronic pain syndromes has to be explained because we have a delayed maturation of the sensory fibers, uh, and we don't have the, the um, uh, pressed high, high number of uh, sodium channels and clustering uh, uh, on the tips of the nerves. Children present greater plasticity, and this also affects uh, uh, their development, uh, uh, their neurological development. When we examine the general population, we see that 90% of children present a right hand dominance. But if we focus on the children that had um, uh, damage of the brachial plexus on the right side, we see that the right hand dominance uh, decreases to only 17%. And this is because we have a shift from right hand dominance to left hand dominance. Now, this shifting of the dominance is not completely without problems. And this is the reason why we may have children that present a developmental apraxia or that have a speech delay. So finally, I would like to uh, mention that obstetrical brachial plexus palsy are uh, dynamic disorders, to say so. Uh, we have to consider what happens uh, uh, with the growth of the limbs. Uh, and we know that these children present a length a length discrepancy that might actually be equal to 93% uh, of the contralateral unaffected arm. And uh, we started with history, and I'd like also to conclude with history. Uh, this is a picture of the, um, of the wedding of Prince Wilhelm of Prussia, Prussia that was affected by uh, uh, an obstetrical brachial plexus palsy, and always try to hide the, the limb limb discrepancy, um, holding gloves in his hands, uh, so that they would like, you know, um, give the impression that there was um, a prolongation of the, of the limb. They are ongoing condition, and as we said, these children may present the development of uh, deformity, co-contractions uh, um, during their growth, and they might need um, other surgical procedure to correct these issues. So something that we have to keep in mind is that early surgery cannot completely prevent the deformities, but we have enough evidence in literature that early treatment reduces the incidence and severities of the um, uh, subsequent problems. So uh, thank you so much for attention. And that is all. I am here available for questions. Thank you very much, Dr. Deborah Garuz, for this splendid conference. I have some questions. I would yeah. like to hear you. Uh, although th th there is a growing quality of obstetric care, I would like to ask you, is it growing, the number of cases around the world of neonatal so, and, and why? Um, okay, so uh, as I said, uh, we don't really have thorough um, epidemiological studies. There are countries where we have no clues at all. We have some studies um, uh, in Europe, of course, uh, 
Um, so what I can tell you that, for instance, um, uh, we have to consider the conditions of delivery. So I am Italian, and in Italy, um, uh, delivery is always something that happens in hospitals. And we actually manage to keep the incidence of obstetrical brachial plexus palsies quite low. But if you consider another country that are the Netherlands, that has a very high uh, standard of medical care, you can see that their incidence rate is actually six times higher than the Italian rate. And why? Because in the last decades, uh, there has been this social trend uh, that wants to convince women that if they deliver at home with the midwife, this is going to be more natural uh, than if you go and deliver in the hospital. So uh, our friends, uh, Martin Malesti, William Fondak, just to mention some of the neurosurgeons that deal with obstetrical brachial plexus palsies, uh, have a higher uh, percentage of these patients uh, because the occurrence of this you know, circumstances of delivery, um, you know, favor the, 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 this kind of, uh, of injury. Okay. Is there any circumstance that you use Oberlin procedure or intercostal in children? Um, no, I, uh, I never use the intercostal nerves uh, in babies. And uh, I have to say, uh, not even the, the Oberlin procedures. Um, I have to say, I have been a bit scared of doing the Oberlin procedure in children because in babies, because I mean, you know, the, the nerves are really, really tiny. Um, so I, I don't know, maybe I, I um, am uh, overcautious, but I think we should be careful not to damage the hand. And I have to say the results I have with the pectoral muscles uh, for the biceps uh, are really good. So I, I, it also, you know, I mean, I don't need to open another uh, an site of surgery. So, so far I'm, I'm happy with this kind of technique. Yeah. Last question, I, it's, I would like to hear your opinion. What, what do you think is represented in the brain of a baby, I mean, uh, uh, in the motor area, the hand, the arm, or the movement. What 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 is your opinion? In a small uh, baby, well, what that, is represented there? Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a that's a very good question, and uh, this is probably what we need to focus on. Uh, one of the reasons why, as I mentioned before, I think we should reappropriate um, neurosurgeons of this kind of uh, injuries is also because we are the ones dealing with factors like neuroplasticity. Uh, that that is something that the orthopedic or the plastic surgeons have no clues about. Now, what we know very well is that usually the development of the uh, motor cortex. Uh, um, or whatever kind of cortex uh, is related to the um, feedback, right? I mean, we all studied those experiments that if you take the kittens and, and you uh, stitch the eyelids um, uh, immediately after they are born, uh, you see that there is no development of the visual cortex. So um, I, I don't think we have a, done a study yet, but I think if we would do um, a functional MRI on these babies, uh, we would probably see that the motor cortex related to the limb that has been affected by the lesion is probably uh, underdeveloped uh, uh, because of the, of the lack of input. And I believe that, again, this might be the reason why the babies with total pulses uh, present results that are less good than the babies with um, uh, partial pulses. In other words, when we examine the shoulder uh, and the elbow results of babies with total pulses and babies with upper plexus pulses, uh, the, the babies with the total palsy, even when we use the same technique, right? Because we, we do the reconstruction of the upper trunk and the spinal accessory to suprascapular 
uh, nerve transfer, but yet the same surgical technique does not provide the same results. So the only explanation might be related to the fact that because you have a, a, a wider denervation that ultimately impact on the cortex, uh, the neuroplasticity uh, is the reason why um, the, you know, the, um, how can I say, the, the functional performance is not as good. It's not related to the regeneration of the axons. It's related to what happens uh, uh, at the level of the cortex. I don't know if I made myself clear. Yes, yes. Thank you very much. Uh, I would like to congratulate you. It was a very thank nice you. And thank you very much. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. It was indeed a very enlightening lecture and uh, we learned a lot. Uh, I would like to ask Professor Karuzu that children are very tiny. These nerves are very, very small. How do you really identify them in children? Do you use intraoperative neurophysiology? Um, so uh, when I do this, uh, when I do procedures for peripheral nerve surgery, and I am sure that Fernando agrees with me, uh, you always operate under magnification. So I always start the um, uh, exploration uh, with loops, uh, which is a magnification of uh, approximately 3, 3.5. And then you do the sutures uh, under the microscope. The, the microscope uh, is probably the best ally that we have in the OT. And this is, for instance, another difference between us and the orthopedic surgeons or the plastic surgeons, because that they, they are not trained. They don't use the microscope, right? Uh, if you see plastic surgeons uh, or orthopedic surgeons performing nerve sutures, uh, they just use the magnification uh, provided by the loops. Uh, and there is a big difference between the loops uh, and, and the micro, uh, microscope. Um, and then, yes, I do use neurophysiology. Uh, I, I rely on direct electric stimulation um, I also try to use um, intraoperative uh, monitoring, but I have to say, um, you know, usually we, we neurosurgeons use the, the intraoperative monitoring where they are performing some procedures and they want to preserve uh, a damage to the nerves, right? Like, for instance, uh, the spine surgeons uh, that perform some fixation, like, for instance, uh, an X lift. Um, they they want to do the the intraoperative um, um, physiology uh, because they want to see if they might do something that causes a damage. Um, it's a different mindset. We already have nerves that have been damaged, and what we need to understand, and this is actually quite tricky and might not be easy to do uh, for somebody that is not so experienced, uh, is that. As I mentioned before, in babies, uh, uh, there is never a complete denervation. There is always um, uh, some potential. And the, the experienced surgeon has to understand whether that's enough to recover, which means to provide a valid function, or this is not possible. And then we are the ones that have to find a way to provide a valid function. Right, that was uh, wonderful. Uh, one another question, how often do you use phrenic nerve transfers in babies? Oh, you're going to get me started on that. I never use it. Actually, I never use phrenic nerve transfers uh, in any patients. Even if I, as you mentioned, I, I did a fellowship in Wanshan Hospital with Professor Gu. Um, I am absolutely adamant in saying that this is a surgical technique that should be absolutely abandoned. Uh, the Russian group uh, themselves have demonstrated that using the phrenic nerve in children that are younger than 36 months, which means three years basically, can actually expose uh, the babies uh, to a very high risk of um, complications. Uh, and especially these children may develop rib cage deformity. So this is a very serious complication. Um, remember when we spoke about the surgical timing, 
I said that some authors advocate that we you should go for surgery when the babies are even younger than three months. Now, what I always try to emphasize is that, okay, of course we focus on trying to repair the brachial plexus, uh, but we have to consider that the brachial plexus is part of an individual. And we have to consider the overall uh, well-being of the baby. So, um, I would never sacrifice the phrenic nerve in a baby if I think that, yes, okay, I can recover a valid elbow flexion, but what if the child is going to have complications like pneumonias, continuous infections, deformity of the rib cage? Uh, the price is too high. And even when we use them in, in uh, adults, um, I, I don't like it because um, you you usually operate uh, even adult patients when they're very young. Most of the brachial plexus injury occur between 15 and 35 years of age. You do not know how the lack, the paralysis of the, of the um, phrenic nerve is going to impact on these patients when they get old. When we know that there is already a different performance of the lungs. So I think we should be very careful. We have to improve the situation of our patients. We are not supposed to apply surgical techniques that might damage the patient, that might add uh, invalidity currently. And even we have to think of what happens in the long run. This is my idea. So for me, phrenic nerve should be absolutely abandoned. Uh, the, the risks are too high. And I personally um, wouldn't do it. I don't do it. I, I, I am an enemy of this technique. Thank you. Thank you very much. We can I don't know what's the idea of Fernando. Professor if you Gures, agree with any me comments or not. from you on that? Would you like to comment, Professor Gudes? Yeah, yes, I agree with her. I agree with Professor Deborah Garwazi. It's it's a very dangerous technique. Although in adults, uh, it has been used for many times. We have published a paper last year about uh, the anatomy of the phrenic nerve. Um, and it's, it, there are some interesting facts. I may send you later this paper in cadavers, of course. And the idea is that in the future, you can take uh, by endoscopy, but just part of the phrenic nerve. Then you don't, that there's no need to denervate completely the diaphragma muscle. But I agree with Professor Garros. In children, it's, it's, it's very dangerous. And in these times of COVID, I, I'm very curious to know we have many friends that use the uh, phrenic nerves very frequently. And I would like to hear from them. I don't use it. Uh, I would like to hear from them if any patient had problems. Uh, uh, respiratory problems, breathing problems during COVID pandemia. I, I don't know. Do you have any, uh, Deborah, do you have any uh, information about that? Yes. No, 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 no. I'm sorry, I don't. May, right. may, I, may, may, I, may I ask just very quickly one thing? When you have to take a graft, uh, do you use endoscopy like our friend Malazi, or how, how do you do? Uh, no, no, I just, yeah, I just do the, the longitudinal incisions. So I, I never had the possibility to do the endoscopic technique. Okay. Thank just you. the, you know, um, lack of possibilities. Let's put it this way. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. We can invite comments from my co-host, Dr. Libun Singh. Thank, thanks, Raja. Thanks, Professor, for a very nice presentation. I have a few questions here for you, Professor. Is a, a muscle transfer indicated in pediatric? If, if there is, uh, what are the indications? Uh, my second question, Professor, uh, regarding a feedback mechanism, does the passive, uh, early passive limb movement give a feedback for, for nerve regeneration and, and development of the motor cortex? And my last question, Professor, do you think that now uh, those uh, rich position at birth or in labor should go for cesarean section uh, and not vagina delivery? Thank you, Professor. Yeah. 
Okay, so um, let's start from the last one because I might forget uh, it. Okay, so definitely, I think whenever we consider that there might be a breach delivery or uh, a complicated delivery, uh, we should always keep in mind the, the possibility of an obstetrical brachial plexus palsy and give an indication for cesarean section. Um, so I, I, and I think this is something that should be um, implemented with some of the gynees. Uh, um, you know, we also have fashions in medicine, right? Uh, so um, sometimes uh, um, uh, we consider that something is a little bit uh, more trendy or, or, or less. And nowadays, I think there is a tendency to go back to the natural delivery, and we forget that the natural delivery uh, actually entails uh, high risks um, of complications and might be even lethal for the for the mother or severe for the child. So I think, uh, of course, we should not exaggerate with the indication for cesarean section, but um, Cesarean sections uh, has to be given when, whenever there are, you know, conditions like the, the one you mentioned of the bridge delivery, for sure. Uh, then the first question was uh, um, muscle the muscle transfer. Okay, uh, I don't think we really uh, were talking about free muscle transfer or muscle transfer, uh, like uh, unipolar muscle transfer. So, because if we don't... A unipolar. Yes, yes, of course. Um, so uh, when I mentioned that we can improve the results of nerve surgery using secondary techniques, um, uh, I was specifically um, mentioned uh, thinking of um, uh, muscle transfers. Uh, um, yes, for sure. Uh, just to give an example, uh, if in uh, shoulder, in the shoulder recovery, uh, for instance, you don't get a valid result for extra rotation. We know that we can do a, a transfer of the latissimus dorsi. So basically what you do is that you just um, uh, move the distal insertion and uh, you bring it on the head of the humerus, uh, and this gives uh, a much uh, better extra rotation. So yes, muscle transfers uh, definitely uh, are something which is, uh, is has to be considered. Um, free muscle transfers, uh, that was what I, I also uh, thought you might uh, wonder. I, I don't think uh, there is anybody that has ever considered to do free muscle transfers in babies. Uh, um, I think, of course, it's not feasible because already in adults, you know, I mean, the, the pedicles, the vascular and the nerve pedicles are really tiny. Normally, you you have like uh, two millimeters calibers of arteries. So, I mean, in babies, it, I honestly think it would be absolutely not feasible. But yes, unipolar muscle transfer, yes, um, have a, a role and it's a very important one. And the second question was about... I forgot. On passive limb movement to give a uh, feedback mechanism for nerve regeneration and uh, uh, development of motor cortex. A passive uh, limb movement. Um, okay, so, um, well, of course we have priorities. Uh, as we said before, it's the, the hand and uh, the biceps and the shoulder. We don't have, we, we cannot have the possibility to reconstruct uh, the plexus in a way that you can recover the, the whole function of the upper limb. Um, so yeah, I, I mean, we always have to, to choose priorities and, and decide what we have to go for. And in total pulses, uh, we always try to, to give the best donor route for the hand. Thank, did thank I you, did I answer did I answer to your question yeah. correctly? No. Actually, my question is because nowadays, uh, with, with especially with stroke patient, they use exo exoskeletal, and it, it shows that the muscle activity, in actual sense, we give a feedback mechanism for the nerve regeneration. So I want to know whether that has been observed in your oh, patient where you do uh, okay. this sort of thing. Uh, well, I, 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 you know, one of the problems that we have is actually that there is not so much research on these lesions. Uh, 
so uh, when it comes to exoskeletons, uh, you know, these are usually situations that are more investigated for patients that suffer spinal cord injuries. But for nerve injuries, um, uh, I, I don't think there is even uh, somebody that I have attempted to make this kind of research. I don't know, if, Fernando, if you uh, heard about that, but for me, it's uh, completely new for, for, the, for the brachial plexus, I mean. Thank you very much, Professor. Thank you. Thank you very much. What followed the wonderful lecture was another wonderful discussion, and we had a great learning from listening to the comments of all of you. And I'm sincerely grateful to both the chair and the speaker, Professor Jose Gudez and Professor Deborah Garuzzo, for this wonderful session. Thank you very much. We move on to the second session. And before that, I'd just like to inquire if Professor Garuzzo or Professor Gudez would be staying back to hear the second session. Uh, yeah, yeah, I'll try to stay as long as I can. Thank you, thank you, thank you very much. So I'll pass on this podium to our second chair, Dr. Sharon Chiafilas, who will say a short introduction and invite Dr. Maya Bhattachan for her lecture. Sharon, all yours. Thank you so much, Raja, for inviting me to this uh, interesting webinar today. Uh, thank you, Prof. Uh, Deborah. It was a fantastic, actually, presentation. Love your presentations. Um, so today we, have, we will be honored by uh, Prof. Maya Bhattachan. Uh, she is going to share with us her experiences. And I think we all want to know, I mean, um, you know, you're coming from a, a LIM, a LMIC country where, you know, we know you have a lot of uh, okay. obstacles and struggles to go through uh, being a neurosurgeon itself. So it'd be interesting to see um, how you all have managed to come through, through it. Okay, so I give the floor to you, Maya. So uh, good evening and namaste, and thank you for having me today to give a talk on women in neurosurgery challenges and opportunities in Nepal. So Nepal is a relatively small developing country, which is sandwiched between India and Nepal, and uh, it is a land of Himalayas. The population is 29.7 million and 28.1% are below 15 years of age and 53.9% are fe uh, female populations. And 27% of the total population lives below the poverty line. The, uh, although we have 32.7% of seats in parliament for women, but we have no actual power. And the proportion of women in managerial positions is around 13%. And the literature, literature, literacy rate of women is 47% whereas it is 72% for the men, because women tend to uh, drop out from the schools uh, due to early marriage and social obligations. So Nepal is a patriarchal, patrilineal, and patrifocal society. Its norms are heavily patriarchal, and patriarchal is reported to occur within all the ethnic groups in Nepal. So in history of women in surgery, I mean, uh, healing has always been a domain of the females. So Isis in ancient times, uh, Isis resurrect, resurrected Osiris. Esculapis, son of Apollo, had four daughters who were all physicians, but Middle Ages were very dark for women physicians and healers because women were uh, banned to practice uh, medicine. Um, uh, practice medicine by the Pope, and they were only allowed surgical practices of their late husbands. And in 14th century, King Henry James said, no carpenter, smith, weaver, or women shall practice surgery, which led to the women being banned from the profession of medicine. And women had to uh, practice medicine in hiding. So the first... Uh, uh, female um, modern surgeons was Dr. James Barry, and he graduated from uh, Edinburgh Medical School in 1812 and joined the army as a surgeon during Napoleonic War. And it was only at the time of his death that he was discovered to be a woman with abdominal findings suggestive of previous pregnancy. And his actual name was Dr. James Miranda Stewart Barry, uh, and he, she, she, he was born as Margaret Ann Bulkley. And she was the first person to uh, successfully perform scissor section in Africa. 
And uh, upon her death, her friend commented that she chose to be a military doctor, not to fight for the right of a woman to become one, but simply to be one. So her passion was just to be a doctor, not to fight for the women's right, not to fight uh, to have a name in the, uh, as a female surgeon or like that. But uh, Dr. Elizabeth Blackwell, uh, she was a very brave soul and she was repeatedly rejected from more than 20 medical schools in the U.S., but still she persisted in studying medicine and following her passion. And uh, she graduated uh, first in a class, uh, but she could not practice uh, as a doctor because she was banned from practicing as a doctor. So she could only work as a midwife and a nurse. And in 1889, 40 years after graduation from medical school, Dr. Blackwell was recognized as the first woman MD in the United States. And she is the one who was men who mentored uh, Dr. Elizabeth Garrett Anderson, who was the first woman doctor in England in 1865. So she is quoted as saying, it is not easy to be a pioneer, but oh, it is fascinating. I would not trade one moment, even the worst moment for all the riches in the world. And also, if society will not admit of women's free development, then the society must be remodeled. And Dr. Mary Mergler, Dean of the Women's Hospital Medical College in 1899, is quoted as saying, no woman studying medicine today will ever know how much it has cost the individuals personally concerned in bringing about these changes, how eagerly they have watched new developments and mourned each defeat and rejoiced with each success. For with them, it meant much more than success or failure for the individual. It meant the failure or success of a grand cause. So in 2017, to appreciate the women in the medical field and surgery, the New Yorker posted a picture of women in scrubs, celebrating the journey of women in surgery. And in uh, England, as of 2018, 54% of the foundation trainees in surgery were women, 20% of specialty and associate specialist surgeons were women, and but only 12% of the consultant surgeons were women. And the proportion was higher in some specialties than in others. And about the history of women in neurosurgery, the first female neurosurgeons were called Tabibs, which was found in the 15th century Turkish book by Serifuddin Sebun Kogli. Uh, they were allowed to practice independently in Anatolia, and they were practicing a form of pediatric neurosurgery by using scalpel and crushing the skull of the dead fetus uh, with who had hydrocephalus or macrocephaly. But the first modern uh, women neurosurgeon was uh, Sofia Inoscu, uh, and first female neurosurgeon from Romania, and Diana Beck, a consultant from England in 1939. And it was also due to the war, because during the war, uh, Dr. Sofia Inoscu performed the first neurosurgical procedure. Uh, but uh, Dr. Diana Beck was uh, the first neurosurgical consultant in 1939, because there was no uh, neurosurgeon present at that time, they were given the opportunity to, to become the first ones. And in the history of Asian neurosurgery, Dr. Aisima Altino completed her neurosurgical training in Turkey in 1959, and Dr. Thanjavir Santana Krishna Kanaka became the first female MCH in, in neurosurgery in March 1968. And uh, Professor Yoko Kato became the first professor of neurosurgery in Japan in 2006. And she was the one uh, who founded uh, in Women's Neurosurgical Association of Japan in 1990 and the uh, Asian Women's Neurosurgical Association in 1996. And she's also, she was also chair of educational committee in WFMS. And Professor Lincoln, professor, she was a professor of neurosurgery and interventional neurosurgery in China, president of Cerebral Vascular Disease Institute in Capital Medical University, dean of interventional graduate school in Capital Medical University in China, and she's director of National Training Center for Neurosurgery. So these are all the female neurosurgeons in Asia. And uh, in the US, Ruth Kerr Jacobi became the first woman diplomat of American Board of Neurological Surgery in 1961. And um, we have a, a few women neurosurgeons who are in a high position, like Dr. Louise Eisenhardt, Professor Shelley Detimans, Professor Ann Stroink. They were uh, the ANS uh, president. And Dr. Gail Russo, past president and co-founder of Women in Neurosurgery and vice president of ANS. 
So women in neurosurgery, in, uh, according to the European Association of Neurosurgeons, only 12% of the neurosurgeons are women neurosurgeons. And in Britain and Ireland, 8% of the neurosurgeons are women. And in Japan, uh, there are only 5.6 uh, women neurosurgeons, out of which only 1.8% are board certified. And US, 15.8% uh, of all uh, uh, female are female neurosurgical residents, and 7% of the women neurosurgeons are board certified. So the history of neurosurgery in Nepal started in 1962, when the first surgery uh, was performed by a general surgeon, Professor Dr. D.N. Dongol, in a patient with a pituitary tumor. And he was the one who motivated uh, and uh, advised uh, Dr. Rupender Devkota to train as a neurosurgeon. And he went to Atkinson Mori Hospital in UK and uh, trained as a neurosurgeon. And he developed uh, neurosurgery into a distinct specialty. And he opened a neurosurgical department in 1989 in the Beer Hospital in Nepal. And in 2008, uh, under his leadership, Nepali Society of Neurological Surgeons was established with 12 founding members who were all, almost all his trainees. And then after the formation of the uh, Nepali Society of Neurosurgeons in 2008, the gradual, gradually concept of subspeciality was also developed. And in 2016, we had our uh, neurospine chapter and 2018 neurovascular chapter. And as of 2022, we are a total of uh, 108 board certified neurosurgeons, out of which nine are nine are women neurosurgeons. So we comprise 8.3% uh, of the total neurosurgeons in Nepal. So now we are gradually seeing the increase in uh, female students uh, for the medical entrance exam. So this trend has been increasing over the years. And uh, even though we are very few in numbers, we took a survey and asked about uh, the marriage uh, and children. Did they affect, uh, how, what, what time did they get married, all the neuro, female neurosurgeons, and what time did they have their children? And uh, almost all, uh, most of them said they got married during the time of residency, but they had children after the residency. So it means that the residency is very rigorous for neurosurgery. And uh, when asked if uh, marriage and children affected the career as a neurosurgeon, um, most of majority said that uh, children affected their uh, career as a neurosurgeon uh, uh, more than uh, marriage. And uh, in Nepal, we have a traditional uh, family, joint family, uh, and some uh, nuclear family. And when asked, uh, most of the uh, female women neurosurgeons live in a joint family. And uh, they mo almost all said that uh, joint family is very helpful than the nuclear family. And um, when asked if family is supportive, if uh, there's any difficulty, if the spouse is supportive or not, and uh, almost everybody said the family is very supportive. Majority said the spouse is also very supportive, but, uh, Balancing neurosurgery and the social obligation is very difficult. So uh, when asked uh, if marriage uh, had effect on their careers uh, or children had effect on their careers, they said marriage has improved their uh, career, but children has uh, somehow uh, arrested their uh, career potential. And almost uh, all uh, women neurosurgeons feel that they have neglected their children, uh, but they said they have not neglected their house or spouse. And they feel guilty that they have neglected the children because the working hours is very high and it's a rigorous job. And uh, when asked, is it, is it easy to maintain career after marriage and children? Uh, majority said yes. It's easy to maintain career after children, but it's a little bit difficult to maintain career uh, after married, uh, children and marriage. So uh, almost all said they are very satisfied with their training and position as a neurosurgeon. And is it comfortable doing surgery alone with colleague or with supervisor? Majority said that it is very easy to do surgery uh, alone and uh, with colleague rather than with uh, su uh, supervisor. And the trust for big cases, uh, do they do the patient trust them for big cases? Do the colleagues 
uh, trust them for big cases. Almost all said that the, uh, their colleagues trusted them for the cases more. And uh, now uh, the patient is also trusting for the cases uh, now. And uh, when asked, do you second guess yourself for the big cases? Like if, if there is any problem, uh, if you are not feeling confident about it, uh, do you send the patient, refer the patient or not? Then they said, yes, if they are not confident, they won't do the surgery at all. So, and uh, when asked, then when you, then you, do you understand when you, when you need to leave the case? Like when you don't, when you say you don't, uh, you cannot do the surgery and you have to refer hundred, they said hundred percent that if we are not confident, we refer the case. And when asked uh, if people encouraged you to join neurosurgery or discouraged you to join neurosurgery, almost everybody encouraged and almost everybody discouraged them to join neurosurgery. And when asked if they miss, if people mistake you for nurses and doctors other than neurosurgeon, everybody said yes. So do you think any change in uh, residency is needed for the female? They said no. And did, you, did they face any discrimination during residency or in job application? They said no. So they always wanted to be a neurosurgeon and they had the role model, female role model as a child. Uh, and they are very happy with their job as a neurosurgeon. And they are very happy uh, to have family and career choice as a neurosurgeon. So challenges of a woman neurosurgeon in Nepal. It's a lot because we have lots on our plate. We have career, household duties, babies, uh, social obligation, um, trainings, keep on learning, getting higher degrees and all. So the challenges faced by women in all surgical careers is conflict between personal life, career, rigid structure of the surgical training, uh, lab examples, mentors, and discrimination. So gender, there are gender barriers in surgery, which is unfavorable work environment due to harassment, difficulty in establishing legitimacy, challenges is motherhood, uh, it makes the work-life balance uh, difficult to maintain, insufficient support, and negative perception of working mothers. And also, the because of the male-dominated culture, uh, they tend to be excluded and confirm. You have to conform to male standards to get more opportunities, and so there is inequality in career progression. And there's also a societal pressure of higher expectation, and you are bunched into a stereotype. That's why there, there are gender barriers in surgery. So how we are compelled to tackle this field, there are three distinct approaches, become one of the guys, uh, essentially denying there's any difference between a uh, women uh, neurosurgeon and a male neurosurgeon and being treated as gender neutral. Or women surgeons can adopt a caricature of traditional female role of being seductive and helpless. Or maybe she has to prove herself and become a superwoman by having it all at both family, home, and uh, job, which may be uh, very, which may seem like it's she's having it all, but she will be having a lot of stress, a lot of uh, she will be burning out more sooner. So this is also not good approach. So uh, women face a lot of organizational cu culture that favors men in the field of surgery. And these cultures often serve to exclude women from the necessary networking and mentoring that are required for promotion to the top position because most of the uh, talk and most of the mentoring, networking happens while uh, dining and smoking, you know. And women uh, has to go home faster to do their household chores, to take care of their babies. So women tend to miss out on a lot of the opportunities. So uh, we have to make adjustments for that. And failure to recognize and make adjustments for women's gear, greater caregiving responsibility will make her lose out a lot of opportunities in her career. So Dr. Bean noted in his editorial accompanying the Wien's white paper that the barriers for women may neither be obvious nor even acknowledged, but they exist. So the a term glass ceiling is coined, but uh, I think that mountains have no glass ceiling and neurosurgery is a mountain where only your perseverance tough work, hard work, and your pers grit, real, the personal resilience will make you climb to help you climb to the top. 
So uh, there is a concept of gender equality and equity, but we, I think we already have passed through the gender equality period, but what we need is gender equity. So we need to increase the representation of women in the practice of neurosurgery and remove the barriers to participation and inter and introduce flexible training models for any trainee or surgeons, regardless of the uh, gender because uh, now there's paternity leave also and maternity leave also. And also hospitals should have a standard program of support uh, with enhanced supervision for women or men returning to work after maternal or paternal leave and training or support staff to refresh, refresh their clinical skills in supportive environment because they may have feeling of being out of practice and they may become stressed. So they don't, they don't want to take maternity or paternity leave and which may be uh, not conducive for the uh, further uh, work of the uh, female neurosurgeons. So uh, what we are doing in Nepal is we have a registry of women neurosurgeons and we have a, a history of women neurosurgeons of Nepal where we have included all the subspecialties like neurosurgery, orthopedics, cardio cardiovascular, and GI. And there are programs and awareness about women surgeons, women neurosurgeons. And we have a support group of Facebook, Viber, WhatsApp, and e emails. And what we do is we gather periodically and we have uh, we have... Uh, a connecting, networking, training conferences, and we give advice, we share our experiences. That's how we are trying to uh, bring up the younger generations. And we record our trial and tribulations, successes and failures, and we share it with our juniors and with our colleagues. And uh, for, the, for the women neurosurgeons or women surgeons to uh, be ahead of the of the game we have to increase the visibility of us so conferences articles tv shows are much encouraged we have to encourage it so we have uh, this is a small uh, example of the uh, gathering we had uh, with the women in neurosurgery in nepal and uh, she is uh, the first female uh, head of general surgery department, uh, Professor Paleshwa Joshilaki. So now we are in a good position. Most of us are bec becoming senior in our department, and she's the first one who is a chair of the department in Nepal. So there are lots of opportunities for uh, women neurosurgeons. We are more easily recognized. We are very visible. And because we are very few in numbers, we are pioneers in all our field, and we have a a uh, great opportunity to see variety of cases and we have opportunity to, to exercise our uh, clinical reasoning, develop skills of flexibility, improvisation, coordination and organization. It's a great place for teaching and training because of the large volume and variety. And the uh, patient, uh, we, are big, we are more patient to the patient family and we are uh, very good at counseling. So the patient and the patient family take us as our, as as if we are their own family and then uh, the patient compliance is higher with us and uh, the attention to detail is high so injury to the patient is less during the operations and we are patient centric so uh, the patient is more liable to i mean uh, be good with us and uh, have a very sympathetic relationship with us and uh, because we are very few we are recognized and uh, the respect and honor for becoming a neurosurgery is uh, nice pretty nice for us now so the total uh, and i'm just saying the total number of admitted patients uh, in my department uh, during the covid time was uh, 953 and uh, the pediatric patients was the most uh, in my uh, department and we do a lot of cases for pediatric surgery and uh, i i get a lot of pediatric cases and uh, most of the cases were from uh, under four years of age and majority is trauma uh, followed by spinal dystrophism and tumors. And But uh, with the successes and with the uh, recognition of being a women neurosurgeon, there are some heartaches and tragedies also. Uh, because when we start uh, treating the cases, sometimes we are so focused on the treatment that we forget about the mental and the psychological issues of the patient. So we lost this young boy uh, because he was so depressed during the treatment. We didn't know that. And he committed suicide after the surgery. 
and uh, this is the girl that we uh, we that was referred to us but she came very late and the treatment uh, was not possible uh, because of the financial reason and also because uh, it was too late and this happens because uh, we get a lot of cases from different parts of Nepal and mostly from the western part of Nepal. And it takes around three to four days uh, of travel to reach, reach the hospital. And uh, by then, it's very late. So there are uh, happiness in surgery, in neurosurgery, and also sometimes heartaches. So there, these are the few uh, female neurosurgeons in Nepal. Uh, Dr. Benju, she is the one who uh, is working in the periphery in the uh, oncological center of Nepal. And she is with her mentor, Dr. Balkrishna Thapa, who passed away in the air crash. So she is the one who is um, doing surgeries for most of the tumor cases. And Dr. Karuna Tamraka, she's the she is here with her mentors, and she is the one who is doing an, an interventional neurosurgery in the periphery of Nepal, in the eastern part of Nepal. And uh, though most of the cases is diagnostic because uh, patient cannot afford coiling and uh, embolization, so most of the cases she does is uh, diagnostic. But Still, she's starting uh, in her own way uh, in the eastern part of Nepal, uh, interventional neurosurgery. And uh, Dr. Risha Shrestha with her mentor, uh, Professor Pan, and uh, her mentor is uh, Professor Taira from Japan also, and she's the only one doing uh, functional neurosurgery in Nepal now. So uh, as we are few, whatever field we choose, we are pioneers in our field. So this is a great opportunity. So take home messages. So we need the same neurosurgical residency program, uh, regardless of the gender. And we do not condone any special privilege. Hard work, learning, and dedication should not be compromised. But the working environment should be family friendly. And gender balance, balance should be uh, at the management level with diversity. And strong anti-sexual harassment policies should be there and uh, mentorship is is very very important in uh, the field of neurosurgery uh, as uh, we say that it takes a whole village to raise a child it takes a it takes a lot of neurosurgeons from different continent uh, countries to make uh, one a neurosurgeon so this is my alma mater uh, and these are all my professors, my colleagues, and my juniors. You can even learn uh, things from your uh, patients, from your juniors, from your students. So mentorship uh, is not only for the teachers or for the seniors, but it's also uh, from, the, from your colleagues and from your juniors and from the medical students. So these are all my mentors without whom uh, I would not be a neurosurgeon not today. So they all supported me, Professor Dev Kota, uh, Professor Began, uh, Professor Mohan, Professor Silpakar, uh, Professor Shigemori, Professor uh, Gopal, Professor Pant, Lingfeng, Professor Lingfeng, and Krishna So it, it, it takes a lot of mentorship uh, for us to be where we are because neurosurgery is not just a theoretical uh, program it's uh, you have to have an acquired skill and to get a skill you have to have it passed down through the generations and through your seniors and through your teachers so mentorship is very very important and what we are lacking for women neurosurgeon is uh, mentorship because uh, we need we miss a lot of uh, opportunities to get trainings to get uh, in touch with the mentors because uh, women tend to be a little bit uh, shy uh, to go forward and uh, they are not there in the parties also they tend to stick together in a group they are not so widespread that's why we have to uh, we have to uh, understand and consider about the women's uh, uh, main you know behavior or what we can say their uh, character so if if you are a teacher and if you have a female uh, surgical intern a resident under you you have to make sure that she doesn't miss out on the opportunities that she is there to uh, with you and you teach her the skills because she may not be able to say that i need to learn this you know so you should take special care so i'm very indebted to all my mentors because if they were not there i would not be here 
And despite all the difficulties, we occupy 8% of the total neurosurgeons of Nepal, which is more than compared to most of the other countries. And we are neurosurgeon mothers, daughters, and homemakers. And we are happy with that. And we hope the numbers will continue to grow in future. And uh, I know that uh, only mentors are, are not uh, sufficient to become a successful neurosurgeon. You also have to have support from the family. And without family, uh, also, it's very difficult to progress in the career of neurosurgery. So uh, I would like to thank all my family and my mentors uh, for making me who I am today. Thank you. And there's a, a Nepalese Society of Neurosurgeons a conference in Pokhara in September. So I would like to invite you all, please come and join us in our conference. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, Maya. I think that was a very enlightening uh, insight into actually generally women neurosurgeons and also uh, how neurosurgery progressed in your country in Nepal, plus how the women they are doing. I think you're putting a lot of great work in there. And I think you brought up also a lot of questions that um, I think every everyone in the world are still, you know, trying to figure out how to get over a lot of these barriers. You know, we, we're trying to help each other in every way. I think there are a lot of, uh, I think we should say there are a lot of male neurosurgeons who are actually uh, assisting us. And I think without their help, we won't be actually half of where we are today. Yeah. And I think most of us, you know, even me, I have to say that my mentors were all, uh, you know, senior male neurosurgeons and they were really, I mean, they never looked at me as a woman. Yeah, and, uh, that was very helpful, I think, you know, and, and of course, like you say, we can never compromise our hard work, our dedication and, you know, in, in becoming a good neurosurgeon. I think that one is same for everything, everyone, men yeah. or women. And I think it's true today also, like you say, there's paternity leave and maternity leave. I think uh, even that, I think is about the same. I think if 10 to 20 years from now, I don't think we will be having a woman neurosurgeon uh, anymore. Maybe we'll have a man in neurosurgery or something like that. All right. So I, I, I yeah. Any questions? Any questions from the well, floor? Any comments? comments from Prophet yeah, I think Dara comments. Sir. I think maybe Deborah, you might have Prophet some Dara comments. Sir. Please unmute your mic, Professor. So, uh, well, I mean, uh, I think we all know that to become a, a, a woman and as neuro, doing neurosurgery uh, has been a little bit of a challenge, especially many decades ago. Um, like, you know, for instance, when I started uh, to decide that you wanted to be a neurosurgeon in Italy, that is uh, quite uh, patriarchal, even if you might not think so, as well, uh, was not something that was like, you know, a choice supported by many people. Nevertheless, I think we do have to consider that uh, things have changed. Uh, things have changed a lot. Um, so my personal position is that we should not emphasize anymore the idea of women in neurosurgery. We should just talk about neurosurgeons and that's it. Um, I think your presentation uh, was incredibly interesting because the, the initial part might actually uh, uh, make people think that a female neurosurgeon in Nepal may have um, remarkable issues related to discrimination. But uh, you clearly showed in your presentation that at the end of the day, in spite of being in a, in a society that might be judged patriarchal, when it comes to neurosurgery, I, I didn't get the impression that women deciding to become neurosurgeons were discriminated. Mm -hmm. So for me, this already shows that there is no need to go on talking about women in neurosurgeons. I think we should just talk about the challenges that every individual, regardless of their gender, may have when they decide to embrace a challenging subspecialty like neurosurgery. This would be my personal idea. Yes, because uh, as I said before that... Uh, Mountains have no uh, barriers, you know. Mountains are very, you know, rigid and it's very cruel, it's very tough. And the way you climb the mountain is through individual grit and resilience and hard work. You cannot uh, hold on to someone and climb, you know. So neurosurgery, you do everything by your own uh, ability. But the thing is, you need mentors. 
and uh, i've been very we have been very fortunate that we have very uh, good mentorship in our country because uh, we all have our mentors in nepal and without our mentors we would not be here you know so our mentors didn't uh, discriminate between uh, a male and a female uh, resident you know so we should have uh, the same kind of thought about uh, giving the younger generation opportunities and trainings and skills you know so we are very fortunate we are very small in number and we are we know e each other very well and that's why they are very good to us and we have been very very fortunate so there's no discrimination faced by yeah. us yeah, th this is what I say. I think we should simply uh, stop talking about the difficulties of women in neurosurgery. I think we should probably focus on something else. We should talk about how difficult it might be, be to become a neurosurgeon. And I think everybody should have the, the same possibilities, the same opportunities. Uh, one of the things I like most of your presentation is when you mentioned that when it comes to um, flexibility during the training, uh, the same should be applied both for men and women. Yeah. It's not that if you're a woman, you, you can have flexibility in your training uh, because a man may have con situations uh, that they, uh, that might actually require that he also has flexibility and he also has the right to take care of his children. It's not only women. Of course, we know that there are biological reasons um, that imply that women are, let's say, more involved at the least in the first part of life. I'm not denying that. But I mean, let's not just consider only to try to um uh to um to facilitate uh life for female neurosurgeons so let's not forget that in some uh, social environments even for a man to become a neurosurgeon may be quite challenging so my um idea would be that we simply stop talking about how difficult may be for a woman to become a neurosurgeon and we just simply start to talk about how difficult may be to become a neurosurgeon and that's it and um, I don't know I'm, I'm not very much in favor of these meetings where you just have women gathering and talking about their problems um, but I, I think this should be probably or on a more a large platform uh, like, you know, uh, young neurosurgeons, uh, uh, both men and women gathering and exchanging uh, uh, information and support, not just making something just for the females. Uh, um, I would, I, I have this idea of um, inclusion in neurosurgery, um, letting alone the, the genders and, uh, and, uh, um, and the geographical location and everything just talk about how we can support everybody that wants to become a neurosurgeon. That's it. Thank you. Maya, Maya Thank can you. I ask you a question? Um, you, did, yes. you did a survey where you um, did a survey on all the women when yes. you asked them about, you know, the fam, the children, the family. Did you do that survey? Did, yeah. you do, did you do a survey with like that for the men? Because it'd be interesting to see the feedback. Because you see, yeah. I've come to realize um, nowadays that a lot of men are actually yeah. very invested with their children and, and wives yes. too. And, you know, I think yeah. like what you said, something very important that a lot of the women neurosurgeons felt that in, more than missing out with the marriage, they felt that they lost time with the children. That what meant more. And yeah. I think that also should go, I think that goes the same with a lot of uh, I mean, neurosurgeons in general, that they lose yeah. a lot of time with their children and then they mm -hmm. come up to a certain age and, you know, that's when they want to spend more time. And I think you miss out the most important yeah. guy. Yeah. So I, it would be interesting if you actually did that survey with everyone and then we can see how, you know, the, the responses. Because uh, I, I, I did I, so Yeah. Okay, I did the survey for all the surgeons, you know, female surgeons, but um, I have been getting suggestions to do the survey for the male surgeons also. So <laughs> I'm trying to do for the male and the female in the <laughs> next step. It will it'd be interesting to know the because I've had uh, male neurosurgeons uh, ask another neurosurgeon how they, they divided the time between their family and work. So it's interesting that even they 
struggle. So you know, it would be nice to know and actually you know find out how you you we you know how they feel about it because I think this is not just a, a, you know a gender thing. You know, ah, huh? I mean especially it's, in this present the, generation, training, everyone wants you know? quality. Yeah. The neurosurgical program is very, till now, it's very Monday. rigid. Yeah. And the thing is, uh, the most, uh, the, the, the main part of the training is when you are at the very uh, reproductive age, you know, when you are at the time when you, you can have kids and have family. At that time is the training period. And it's very, very intense. So you, you don't take any time off you know so everybody got married during the residency but they didn't dare to have children during the residency because everybody knew that it's very hectic and it's very rigorous but the training should be very hectic and rigorous but uh, we should also consider about uh, the, the reproductive part of the women neurosurgeons or the women surgeons and for the male also because if the wife is pregnant he should also get I mean the paternity leave so the training program should be flexible very very well said thank you very much we had a wonderful discussion and we learned it was an eye opener <laughs> would I rather say uh, <laughs> listening to the problems faced by our female counterparts. Thank you, thank you very much for this wonderful lecture. So I think no, it's, we'll close this now officially on behalf of the Education no. Committee of the ACNS and the President, Professor Yoko Kato. I would like to thank both speakers of today, Professor Deborah Garosu and Dr. Mayar Bhattajan, as well as the chairs, Professor Jose Gides and Dr. Sharon Theopoulos for this time and support for the ACNS webinars. I'd like to express my sincere thanks to Professor Shubin for broadcasting this webinar on the WeChat channel and also my co-host Dr. Lubun Singh for joining in today. So until we meet again on next Wednesday, it is bye-bye from all of us. Thank you very much for joining.